Oh, I gotta say, you know, I really do enjoy myself out here. You know, it's a bit of exercise. I get to enjoy uh, the beauty of nature. Uh, I get to talk philosophy. I even get to exert some creativity uh, with the videos. You know, I, I choose a you know, place to point the camera and I try to have some basics in composition. Even what I say is an exercise in creativity. There's lots of ways to express these concepts and I try to find uh, the one that's the most useful or the one that's going to be best for, for, for comprehension. Now all this has to contribute to my happiness. I am happy being out here. I, I enjoy myself. It's, it's a wonderful experience. So it's pretty easy to think that happiness has at least something to do with morality, right? That, you know, we're asking the question, remember this question of morality is how are we to live our life? And it seems like happiness ought to have something to do with that. Um, well, in this, uh, in this chapter, we're looking at a view called utilitarianism. Utilitarianism says that uh, happiness not only has something to do with morality, that's all there is to morality. So, Let's just be clear here what's happening. Uh, the only thing that has any kind of moral consideration is happiness. Right? Is happiness. Now, this means that um, you know laws, you know laws in a society are moral only to the extent that they contribute to happiness. And you know, if a law does not contribute to happiness, if it actually causes more suffering or unhappiness or misery, then you're not morally obligated to follow the law. Um, you know, the thing that, that matters is happiness. It doesn't matter what abstract rules say. So if we're talking about social contract theory, it doesn't matter necessarily what rational agents would say, just so long as what they say actually promotes happiness. Uh, there really aren't any such things as rights. There's just happiness. And, what, and morality is measured just in terms of that happiness. There's no fidelity to a culture or to a religion. Uh, to any deity, all that matters is happiness. And this, this is called utilitarianism. So we're going to look at uh, some kind of, at least some applications of what utilitarianism means and uh, try to sort out exactly what's happening here. So this idea that happiness is the only thing that matters when we're talking about morality uh, is summarized in this principle of utility. And roughly what this means is that uh, you ought to act in the way that produces uh, the most happiness. You ought to act in the way that produces the most happiness. So, you know, to be clear, um, this doesn't mean, you know, what, what's excluded from this is uh, you ought to act in a way that produces some happiness. No, no. It has to be the most happiness. Um, and like I said, this is the only moral consideration is, is happiness for, for the utilitarian. Now, a uh, you know, question is going to come up really quick as to exactly what is happiness. Um, you know, we've looked at some ideas suggested in virtue ethics. Um, we've even at, looked at some ideas uh, when we're talking about interests, when we're talking about benefit. So this has a, a great deal of relevance here. So, you know, exactly what counts as happiness is, is going to be an interesting question. And we're going to look, and Rachel's provides us with three cases that we're going to look at, and we'll see how he's thinking about happiness. And it's worth asking yourself, you know, what do you think happiness is? Right. Uh, so let's look, uh, let's look at those three cases. But keep in mind this principle of utility, that it is, you know, the principle of utility, you, you ought to act in the way that produces the most happiness. The first case that Rachel looks at is uh, Sigmund Freud's death. And the way he describes it is that Freud, near the end of his life, was just an abject misery because of uh, cancer and the, the various symptoms that uh, went along with it, the various ways that he was suffering because of his cancer. And he asked his friend to uh, end his suffering, to, to kill him, right? to kill Freud. So, um, what Rachel's is trying to push on here is that Freud 
would have been happier, uh, it would be happier uh, dying <laughs> rather than um, continuing on and suffering. At the very least, you, know, you might even push it this way, say, well, you know, Freud wouldn't necessarily be uh, happier being dead because you can't be, you know, if you don't exist, then you can't have happiness at all. But um, that, you know, Freud was suffering, he had kind of like a, a negative mark <laughs> in, in the happiness ledger book where he was no longer happy and all that was happening there was suffering and pain and, you know, to, to carry further what would be evil under this view. So Freud is, is pushing on this idea that uh, in the euthanasia case, the utilitarian would say that, yeah, you should euthanize Freud because uh, that would end his suffering. And it would you know, decrease the amount of suffering in the world, therefore overall there would be more happiness in the world. Now, Freud, um, Rachel's kind of slips here. He says something very subtly how, um, you know, since Freud is the one that's suffering, that his is the relevant suffering. Right? Um, it's like, well, you, you might wonder about that because utilitarianism does not specify that one person's suffering is more important than another, that one person's happiness is more important than another. Indeed, you know, Rachel says, but pushing on reason and impartiality up to this point, um, exactly who is suffering really isn't at what's questioned, uh, or, or, or it really isn't relevant to the, to, the, uh, to the calculus. It's just the suffering, okay, or the happiness. So you might wonder, and there's room for the utilitarian to think something like this, that I suppose there were 20 people who uh, just couldn't bear the pain of Freud's death, and they would bear it for years and years and years and years to come. Um, should Freud have been euthanized then, since they would have been miserable at his death? You know, it's, it's not clear here with, the, with, with this just with this, this first case. I mean, there is something to say about the suffering of Freud, and that does that does look like it's a morally relevant reason. Uh, there's other ways you can also look at this. Suppose, yeah, we, we have plenty of people today who are near death, but they're being kept alive. Um, and, you know, keeping somebody alive who's in poor health is really expensive. So a utilitarian might look at that and say, yeah, you, you're spending all these resources to keep one person alive, and it's really expensive, but you could take those resources and spend them on people who are you know, in need of food or in shelter, and you can make them happier versus this one person that we're, you know, paying a lot of, we're spending a lot of resources on to keep alive. So you know, exactly who's happy really isn't at what's questioned here. The question is, what is the happiest? Right? It's not just the happy, happiness of one person that's involved, it's all people that are involved. So this is, this is really kind of an interesting thing here for, for, uh, uh, in this case with the euthanasia. I mean, something that's pointing it out here is um, that it doesn't really matter whose happiness. What matters is the greatest uh, amount of happiness. So what's interesting about the Freud case, when we talk about happiness, is the relationship of happiness to suffering. Where uh, suffering is just not neutral in this situation, it's, and it's taking away from the happiness that, that exists. Right. Um, so when we're talking about happiness, we at the very least eliminate suffering, but we also have to have some happiness on top of that. Uh, or in other words, if your only choice is to eliminate suffering or to have suffering, you should eliminate suffering regardless of other consequences. Um, another question that comes up is, you know, whose happiness ma matters here? Whose happiness counts? Um, that is, that is going to be an interesting question. I'm not sure it's clearly answered in this chapter. The uh, next question, or the next case that uh, Rachel looks at is uh, the legalization of marijuana. Now, what's interesting about this um, is that there are simply more consequences than the immediate effect of uh, of using marijuana, and Rachel is is kind of pushing on this. He's, you know, he says, "Yeah, you know, there's there are mild dangers or mild sufferings associated with long-term uh, use of marijuana." He calls it um, mild cognitive impairment. Right? Um, 
And there are also maybe some additional problems such as, uh, you know, you know, we, we have problems with people that are drinking, well, you know, drinking and driving. Well, you're probably going to have some similar problems with people who are uh, under the effect of uh, marijuana, right? So what, what he's pushing on here is there's more in determining whether an act, determining whether marijuana makes you happy than simply, you know, just that act in that moment. You have to consider the long-term consequences and how that is going to affect everything else. So you know, he mentioned... Um, you know all the law enforcement and all the all the resources being devoted to the uh, uh, to uh, uh, to enforcing the law against marijuana, and you know he says that you know since we're spending all this money on law enforcement, we can make things a lot easier on ourselves. We can make, we produce a lot more happiness if we didn't spend this money on uh, on enforcing a law against marijuana. And you know that's something to consider. Sure, you know there's also something else to consider, is that uh, you know a lot of a lot of people suffer a great deal uh, for marijuana to be grown and uh, imported across our, our, our uh, across the uh, borders. You know, there's there's a lot of uh, people who are working uh, growing the marijuana and processing it who are not getting par paid a fair wage. Uh, there are people who die and die horribly as uh, you know as a matter of business in, in the marijuana trade. And you know, we might say, well, a lot of that would stop if we simply made it legal. I'm like, well maybe here but that's not really happening here <laughs> it's also uh, happening across our borders so you know, and again that's not the end of the story either but there are lots of consequences to consider when you're thinking about this happiness something else is happening here as well uh, Rachel's is pushing on this idea of the physical pleasures as happiness and that that's important you know you do need pleasure uh, for happiness so, you know, we're dealing with physical pleasures uh, as happiness here in this section. And, you know, physical pleasures are important. They are important to happiness. If you, if you do not experience pleasure in your life, you're going to be miserable. You're going to suffer from depression. Uh, you're probably going to be very bitter and angry. So, it's not to say that pleasure is completely irrelevant to happiness. Um, but it's, it's probably not the only thing that's relevant to happiness. I mean, one of the things that Rachel considers when he's talking about the cost of, of uh, marijuana is not just the financial cost but the cost on your cognitive ability so he's he's hinting at this idea that your cognitive abilities are gonna uh, matter when it when it when when we're considering happiness right? you know he, he thinks that you know he says that long-term use of marijuana uh, has a mild cognitive impairment and that's enough to say, well, you shouldn't have long-term or frequent use of marijuana. It should be occasional use because you don't want to lose your cognitive abilities. Well, if, you're not, if you don't want to lose your cognitive abilities, right, then there's more to happiness than simply pleasure. Because it's really simple um, to be pleasured or in a, in a state of pleasure all the time and to be really unintelligent, right, to not develop your cognitive abilities at all. As a matter of fact, we think that's kind of a worse state in life if you don't develop your cognitive abilities at all. So we're already setting up this interesting question when we're talking about happiness. Where, you know, certainly the physical pleasures are involved, but there's also cognitive abilities. Now, you know, I enjoy, I, I, like for instance, I enjoy working out problems of mathematical logic. I enjoy thinking about concepts. Now, the, the joy that I have in doing that uh, is not really the same thing as, you know, um, your average Friday night at a nightclub, right? That's a different sensation right there. Uh, I enjoy thinking about concepts, but I'm not sure I'd... You know, I might even use the word pleasure, but it's not the same kind of pleasure as uh, hanging out with my friends um, and, you know, having a really good time. Right? So... You know, having a fun time, or in other words, there's a way, you know, maybe the way of saying is it is that there's a real difference between intellectual pursuits and fun. Right? Intellectual pursuits and fun. And Rachel says introduced this idea, whether he wanted to or not, <laughs> uh, that there's more to happiness than than simply the ple than simply the fun or simply the pleasures. There's also, at the very least, there's the cognitive intellectual pursuits. Can you hear that? Got a 
little musical accompaniment out here with the uh, various wildlife. <laughs> uh, you can hear the, I think it's a cicada in, in the back. I think it's a cicada. I don't, <laughs> I'm not an expert in, in insects. Um, they have the cicada in the background making a noise. Um, I've seen several lizards out here. I'm sure there are several more around me right now. I'd be willing to bet there's at least a deer or two that can hear my voice at the moment. Well, these are uh, all things that can experience at least something that, that's like suffering. Right? Uh, when you look at insects, they appear to want to live. They uh, try to function in a way, and they try to avoid damage. They try to avoid what we might, you know, what we might think of as suffering. Um, animals do the same thing. Animals uh, appear to experience pain. Um, and, you know, as a matter of fact, there's really good evidence that shows that they actually experience what we experience as pain because they have a lot of the same hardware. You know, mammals and such. They have a lot of the same hardware we do when we're talking, you know, I talk about the nerves and, and, and uh, the regions of the brain um, when we're talking about pain. So an interesting question pops up here. You know, are there, you know, especially when we're talking, you know, we're talking about um, whose suffering matters? Well, not only like who, but the individual, but um, what kind of thing is suffering? What kind of thing is experiencing happiness? So when we're dealing uh, with happiness with the utilitarian, we're dealing with a lot more critter, critters than humans. <laughs> humans are only one critter to consider. We got lots of non-human critters out there. The cicadas, the deer, the lizards I've seen. There's a fly sitting on the bench right, bench right next to me. That's, uh, that's another critter. Um, you know, there are lots of birds around me right now, although I can't see them. They're not moving right now. There's something to consider when we're talking about their kind of suffering. Now it's important to remember that, you know, the happiness for a bird, for a cicada, for a lizard, well, it's going to be different than our own. At least, at least some differences. Right? When we're talking about physical pain, that seems pretty straightforward. And we're talking about the, you know, the joy and happiness that a human being can experience, especially when we're referring to what we what we talked about earlier as these, you know, these cognitive pleasures, these cognitive joys, this cognitive happiness, well, it's a different kind of thing than, than a, a cicada or a lizard or a deer. You know, most critters, uh, if not all critters, don't have an active mental life like we do. There's some borderline cases, and we'll discuss that in class. Maybe I, maybe I can show some examples. Uh, you know, the, like for instance, uh, Coco the gorilla uh, was able to use sign language, so she had language, so she probably had concepts. Right? Uh, there, there are other critters out there that seem to have something like language, so maybe they have concepts as well. Um, but, you know, no critter on the planet does what we do as far as, you know, philosophy, mathematics, history, science. Uh, so there's a real difference there. question is, how much difference? Right. Does all that matter? So, for instance, with this park here, um, you know, I'm sitting on a bench. There's a pathway that's been cut through the park. Right? And this has had an impact on the wildlife in the area. My presence here has an impact on the wildlife in the area. Now, I'm here, amongst other things, to experience beauty and to experience that, that joy. Uh, which is which is more than just a physical pleasure. We, we we've talked about ideas of beauty before. You know, there's something happening more with beauty than than just appearances. Now, does that mean that you know our desire to create a park outweighs the desires of the critter to live undisturbed? That's an interesting question. Uh, we you know. Even just fulfilling that want to create a park, to cut a path through the park, that brings with it a certain kind of satisfaction, achievement, a certain kind of joy. Okay. Uh, does that outweigh the critter's satisfaction with life and having a, a park or having an, an area that's undisturbed? 
Now these, these are more interesting questions when we're trying to deal with happiness and suffering for the utilitarian. It's going to evolve a lot of metaphysics. It's going to evolve a lot of physics too. And this is something worth considering again, where we're, especially when we're comparing the Freud case. Right? Is whose happiness matters? You know, if our cognitive joys override any pleasure, any physical pleasures, well, that really seems like it overrides any uh, critter's pleasure, any critter's uh, satisfaction with life. So what are we supposed to do with that? Yeah, there, there's something to what the utilitarian has to say about happiness. It's worth thinking about these questions about, about happiness. Another really great thing the utilitarian brings to the table is consequences. Right? So remember for the utilitarian, the kind of act isn't really what's important here. What's important is, is the production of happiness. So that forces us to think about the consequences of our actions. And that's a really good thing to do is to think about consequences. The utilitarian, however, says, you know, yes, happiness is important, and yes, consequences are important. And by the way, those are the only things that are important, is happiness and consequences. It could be a tough pill to swallow. Mm 